Au. So welcome everybody to this uh, afternoon session. We will have a talk and then a, a number of uh, gong show. Uh, so the talk is uh, by Edward Witten uh, from the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, as you all know, and is going to talk about instantons and the large n equal to four algebra. Please, Ed. Uh, well, thank you to the organizers and to the ICTP for hosting this meeting and for the invitation to give the talk. So uh, two of the most familiar and most studied examples of ADS-CFT duality involve type 2B superstrings on ADS3 times S3 times either T4 or K3, which appear because they are the two compact hyperkähler manifolds that are possible. And the duals are two-dimensional sigma models in which the target space is the moduli space of instantons on either K3 or T4, as the case may be. These models have large supersymmetry algebras, n equals 4 supersymmetry, and those have been important in understanding them. But there's a superficially similar example that's been much less understood, even though it has an even larger supersymmetry algebra. This is type 2B superstring theory, where you replace T4 or K3 by S3 times S1. So it's also a classical solution of supergravity, and there's a fairly extensive literature on it. I think I'm pressing the wrong button. OK. There's a fairly extensive literature, of which these are some of the more relevant papers. So the first two papers in that list showed, by analyzing string theory and supergravity, that the superconformal symmetry of type 2b in this space-time is not the usual so-called small n equals 4 algebra. When people talk about n equals 4 supersymmetry, normally they're referring to what is sometimes called the small n equals 4 algebra. The large one is sufficiently rare that people automatic, normally take for granted that they're talking about the small one. But as I'll explain, as well as the usual n equals 4 supersymmetry algebra, which here I'll call the small one, there's a slightly more unusual large one it doesn't come up too often, but these authors showed that type 2b superstring theory on this space-time has a symmetry under the large n equals 4 algebra. Compared to the small one that you get in more familiar models, such as a sigma model with a hyperkähler target, or type 2b on either one of these space-times. Now, though the dual of type 2b in the space-time I'm interested in today has been unclear, a proposal in the literature has been that the dual is a sigma model with target the instanton moduli space on S3 times S1, which I'll call curly M in this lecture. Curly M will always be the instanton moduli space on this space. The original motivation was largely that the same statement is true in the other examples, that the dual of this or this is instanton moduli space on T4 or K3. So why shouldn't the dual of this one the instanton moduli space here. The goal of today's lecture is to test this conjecture by showing that this sigma model does have the large n equals 4 superconformal symmetry. There are previous partial results of which these are the most notable papers. So, but before I get into that, I want to explain why you might think that the dual might be a sigma model with this target space. So you can give a kind of heuristic explanation by a brain construction, which I want to explain. First of all, the supergravity solution on ADS3 times S3 times S3 times a circle has a non-zero three-form flux on each of the first three factors, ADS3, S3, and S3. By S-duality, the three-form can be of Ramond or Neverschwartz schwartz type or a mixture, but it's the same in all three factors. I'll call the three-form G. It's conventional to call these fluxes Q1, Q5, and Q5 prime, as they're believed to reflect, in some sense, the numbers of brains of indicated kinds. So Q5 and Q5 prime, which are fluxes on compact manifolds, are integers in supergravity. Q1 is really a field strength rather than a flux. 
and it's not really an integer from the point of view of supergravity. In the derivation, we'll start with type 2b on r2 times a circle times the deformed conifal t star s3 times r. So t star s3 is a non-compact Calabi-Yau manifold, the deformed conifold, and we put q5 prime units of g flux on the three sphere that's the center of the deformed conifold. So an important point, detail, is that T star S3 with flux is a supersymmetric configuration that actually has been studied a lot. Then we're going to wrap Q5 D5 brains on R2 times a circle times S3. The S3 is again at the center of T star S3, and all this is localized at a point in R. R was the last factor of the space time, this one. Now, when you wrap D5, uh, sorry, Q5 D5 brains, you get a UQ5 gauge theory. So there's a UQ5 gauge theory in six dimensions on this manifold, R2 times a circle times S3. But this UQ5 gauge theory has a coupling that depends on the G flux. And that coupling can be written this way. It's a three-dimensional Chern-Simons coupling wedged with the field strength, the three-form field strength. That term is a standard part of the D-brain effective action, but it's often written by integration, integration by parts. So if G is D of T2, by integration by parts, what I've written is the same as the trace of F wedge F wedge C2. So some of you will be more familiar with it in that version. Finally, we introduce Q1, D1 brains which are wrapped on, well, the R2 that's going to be the non-compact space time, and then times some points in S1 times S3. But as usual for the D1, D5 system, the D1 brains will dissolve into instantons in the UQ5 gauge theory. So at low energies, we're going to get a sigma model on R2, whose target space will be the moduli space M of instantons on S3 times S1. But it won't be the perhaps most obvious sigma model. OK, sorry. Everything said on this page up to here would be the same if we were on T4 or K3 instead of S3 times S1. The difference is that because of this chern simons -y interaction, the sigma model will have a topologically non-trivial B field at a level Q5 prime. By the level, I just mean the integer coefficient of a topologically non-trivial B field. So this interaction in six dimensions, when, oh, well, okay. First of all, the chern simons interaction is well-defined mod 2 pi. And it's, it's parity odd, and it only involves first derivatives of the field. So when we reduce to a sigma model, it's going to be a B field. But it's going to be a topologically non-trivial B field because of the topologically interesting nature of the chern simons coupling. So, Chern-Simons is not, under big gauge transformations, it's not well-defined as a three-form, but its periods jump by integer multiples of 2 pi. So with Q5 prime an integer, this interaction is going to give a properly quantized but topologically non-trivial B field <coughs> on the sigma model target space, which will be the instanton moduli space. <coughs> so what we get then will be a sigma model in which the target space is the moduli space of UQ5 instantons with instanton number Q1 and with this B field at level Q5 prime. What does this have to do with ADS3 times S3 times S3 times S1? To answer this, we just follow Maldesena's original derivation in the T4 and K3 cases. So we replace the Q5 D5 Okay, we replace the Q5 D5 brains by the near horizon geometry they create. That was the basic idea of Maldesena's derivation. So what is the near horizon geometry they create? Well, first of all, they're wrapped on a six manifold. And the normal bundle to the six manifold is a four dimensional, of course. Locally, it's just R4. And the near horizon geometry of the D5 brains 
you throw away the origin in the R4, well, three things happen roughly. The normal bundle is rank four, which locally means it's just a copy of R4. In the near horizon geometry, you throw away the zero section of the normal bundle. The radial direction of the normal bundle combines with R2 to make a copy of ADS3. That happens exactly the same way it happens for T4 and K3. So you, well, if you're not familiar with it, you'd find exactly the same story in Modisena's original paper. And the angular directions in the normal bundle remain as another copy of S3. So after doing all this, the near horizon geometry is ADS3 times S3 times S3 times a circle. So roughly, modest, just imitating Modisena's derivation, we learn that The D5 brains can be described by the gauge theory I described, which leads to a sigma model whose target space is the moduli space with that non-trivial B field. But on the other hand, the geometry produced by the same brains, or the near horizon geometry they produce, is the one that we're trying to find the dual of. So that gives at least a heuristic explanation that the dual of type 2B on ADS3 times S3 times S3 times a circle should be that particular sigma model. So hopefully that motivates the idea that the string theory on this given space-time is dual to the sigma model with target curly M, and we've determined also the dictionary. Q5 ranks to the maps to the rank of the UQ5 gauge group. Q1 maps to the instanton number, and Q5 prime is the level of a topologically non-trivial B field. Now, I'd next like to motivate the idea that strings in this space-time and also the sigma model with target M both have the slightly unusual large N equals 4 superconformal algebra. But since it's a bit exotic, I don't want to assume you all know what it is. So I'm going to first explain what is the large N equals 4 algebra. And I'll, by way of explaining that, I'll start by reminding us what's the small one. And then we'll discuss how the large one is different. So I'll describe the small one with the example of a free hypermultiplet. You can think of a free hypermultiplet as parameterizing the hyperkähler manifold R4 with its flat mat metric. So the free hypermultiplet has four free scalar fields, phi, and they transform under an SO4 rotation symmetry. But SO4 is SU2 times SU2 divided by Z2. So to keep track of the two SU2s, I've given phi two SU2 indices, an index A for one SU2, A dot for the other. Uh, phi of A is a reality condition that, that I won't stress. And then we have also four fermions. For brevity, I only will consider the positive chirality fermions, let's say. And they also transform into two different SU2s. So I've given them an A dot index and an X. So there are th several SU2 symmetries, one acting on each type of index. The chiral algebra is generated by four supercurrents. And to make the supercurrents, you, you uh, contract one index of, phi of d phi with one index of psi. So that contraction is only invariant under a diagonal copy of two of the SU2s. But you're left over with four supercurrents that transform under an SU2 that acts only on phi and an SU2 that acts only on x. So that's not, shouldn't be a big surprise. If there are four supercurrents with n equals four, it can potentially have SO4 symmetry or SU2 times SU2. The only point I've made is that one SU2 acts only on the bosons, one acts only on the fermions. Now, for the one that acts only on the fermions, we can write chiral currents. A bilinear of the fermions is a current that generates that SU2. And what I've written here are actually the generators of the small n equals four algebra or more precisely, these and the stress tensor generate the small n equals four algebra. So the algebra with these generators, first of all, is the small n equals four algebra. But second, it has an SU2 group of outer automorphisms that acts on the index A of G A X, doesn't act on the currents. And you see that comes from a symmetry that acts only on the bosons. Now, the free hypermultiplet does not have holomorphic or chiral currents that generate this SU2 symmetry because currents that would rotate the scalar field phi are not holomorphic. That might sound like a fussy detail, but it's crucial. 
So the small n equals 4 algebra is the chiral algebra of the free hypermultiplet. It has these generators, and it has an outer automorphism group, SU2, of symmetries. Now, in most theories you meet in real life with these small n equals 4 algebra, the outer automorphism group is not a symmetry. So for the free hypermultiplet, it is a symmetry. But um, if you take a sigma model with target T4 or K3 as examples, these are typical examples in which the outer automorphism group is not realized as a symmetry. It's an outer automorphism of the algebra, but the outer automorphism does not act on the theory on, which, on these particular theories, which have the small n equals 4 algebra. It's a little tricky to find a theory that does have the large n equals 4 algebra, meaning that the algebra is generated by the four supercurrents G, two different SU2 current algebras, and some additional chiral fields that, roughly speaking, are forced on us by the Jacobi identity. Now, I don't want to try to justify in detail the claim that string theory of supergravity in this space time has large n equals 4 symmetry. Well, I'll just note that it has, well, I'll partly motivate it. You see, it has four SU2 symmetries. S3 is the same as SU2. And SU2 has two SU2 symmetries, one acting on the left and one acting on the right. And so therefore, S3 times S3 has four SU2 symmetries. That's the right number for two copies of the large n equals 4 algebra. Because the large n equals 4 algebra has two SU2s, but you're going to get two copies of the large n equals 4 algebra, one for left movers, one for right movers in the sigma model. So you really need four SU2 symmetries, which is how many we have. Notice that on ADS3 times S3 times T4 or K3, we only would have had two SU2 symmetries, which would have only been enough for the small n equals 4 algebra. Actually, I, well, I said I wasn't going to say more about justifying the large one. But just for fun, let's note that potentially we have symmetries exchanging the two S3s. And also, we have a reflection symmetry between left and right. So we have symmetries that pretty much guarantee that you couldn't possibly get the small one without getting the big one. Because if it were true that some of the SU2s were in the chiral algebras of holomorphic or anti-holomorphic degrees of freedom, the others would have to be also in view of the symmetries. Now, how do you get a sigma model with large n equals 4 symmetry? The simplest example is a model with target space S3 times S1. And that's convenient, because we're going to be talking about S3 times S1, and it's not a coincidence. So in this context, when we say S3 is the target, we really mean SU2 at level k. In other words, an SU2 WZW model at level k. In our application, k will be Q5 prime. So um, you see, if you took a sigma model of it, target S3 times S1 without the B field, it wouldn't be conformally invariant at all. A sigma model with target S3 is asymptotically free. It would become massive in the infrared rather than conformally invariant. The Western mean interaction at level k stabilizes it at a radius squared, I guess that's proportional to k. And you get a nice superconformal field theory, but the super, well, a nice conformal field theory. But the superconformal version of it, if you also add a circle, has this large n equals 4 algebra. So I'm going to explain the special geometry of m equals, I'll often refer to S3 times S1 as m, straight m, not curly m. I'll explain the special geometry of m that leads to large n equals 4 symmetry. Then I'll explain how the corresponding instant on moduli space curly m has the same kind of geometry and leads to a sigma model with the same large n equals 4 symmetry. So m itself is the target space that has large n equals 4 symmetry. And its instant on moduli space has the same geometry and the same kind of symmetry. That's an example of many results showing that if a 4-manifold m has some kind of geometry associated with some supersymmetry algebra, then the corresponding instant on moduli space curly m has the same kind of geometry, leading to the same supersymmetry algebra. So the most, here are the most famous cases. If m is Kähler or hyperkähler, 
then curly M is also Kähler or hyperkähler. These are associated to 2, 2 or 4, 4 supersymmetry without a B field. It's also true, although not exactly exploited in supersymmetry, that if M is merely complex, not necessarily Kähler, then curly M is complex. Case is relevant for today, I've listed here. So first of all, and I've also, well, I've indicated uh, references. So one is that if M is a Hermitian manifold, which means a complex manifold with a Hermitian metric, then curly M has a naturally induced Hermitian structure. That is, curly M will also get a complex structure with a Hermitian metric. If M is generalized Kähler, which means the geometry leading to 2-2 supersymmetry with a B field, then so is curly M. If M has the geometry that leads to 0-4 supersymmetry with a B field, with a small n equals 4 algebra, then so is curly M. A result that I think is apparently not in the literature, but is an easy consequence of comparing what the, these two authors did, is that if M is generalized hyperkähler, which leads to 4, 4 supersymmetry with a B field and the small n equals 4 algebra, then so is curly M. And finally, if M also has the extra symmetries that lead to large n equals 4 algebra, then so does curly M. So in all these cases, whatever geometry M has, curly M has the same geometry. So uh, I'm going to try to first explain. So if M is, if M is almost complex, then curly M is not in general almost complex. Is it, from this point of view, can we see what goes wrong with that? Oh, Greg, I'm only discussing conditions related to supersymmetry, because the physical idea, I think, is so, that So that's the point. Almost complex is, almost not, complex a, is, is not, not a condition, condition that leads to supersymmetry. Right. Yes? Just cover the large n equals four. Uh, you are not saying that this would be corresponding or associated to the two copies of D two one alpha, right? Well, D two one alpha is a finite dimensional group, right? Right, but that would be the corresponding idea three s three crosses three crosses one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, this would take us a little bit farther afield to explain that properly, but the question is about. Uh, I've emphasized the chiral algebra then you can look for a finite dimensional group in the chiral algebra. And the group is the uh, super is isometry group of A is 3 times S3 times S1. S3 S times S1. So uh, I think I'm presenting it logically without getting to that point. We can discuss it in more detail at the end, perhaps. Uh, uh, OK. Anyway, I've listed here various conditions for all kinds of supersymmetries. And they all have the property that if M has that type of geometry that leads to that kind of supersymmetry, in a, sorry, if M has the target space of a sigma model would have a certain kind of supersymmetry, then curly M does the same thing. But so now the rest of my talk will be in two parts. First, I'll explain the ge relevant geometry of S3 times S1. And then I'll explain how to prove that curly M has the same geometry. So S3 times S1 is sometimes called a hop surface. And it's often given as the simplest example of a complex, compact complex manifold that's not Kähler. To explain its special properties, start with R4 with a scale invariant metric. So I take the standard metric, dx squared, in the numerator. But I've divided by x squared to make it scale invariant, invariant under rescaling of x. Since it is scale invariant, we can divide by x going to e to the tx for any positive t. If I divide by that operation, the quotient is compact. And you can see the quotient will just be s3 times s1. Because, well, OK. I should say you throw away the origin. And then you divide R4 minus the origin by this. So the distance from the origin is a positive real number. But when you divide by rescaling the distance by e to the t, that means you can, up to rescaling, it's between 1 and e to the t. So it lives in a compact space, a circle. 
1 is equivalent to e to the t, so you've compactified it to a circle. And the angles are a copy of S3. So the quotient is S3 times S1. And it's S3 times S1 with a metric which I have, can write this way. The unit metric on a th three sphere of radius, round metric on a three sphere of radius 1, and a flat metric on a circle of circumference t. Well, how do we see that S3 times S1 is a complex manifold? We just combine the x's in pairs into complex variables. So if z1 is x1 plus ix2 and z2 is x3 plus ix4, then we can parameterize s3 times s1 by complex variables z1 and z2. And the equivalence relation rescales them by e to the t. And that's a holomorphic operation. So the quotient is a complex manifold with a complex structure that I'll call i. In this complex structure, it's easy to see that the metric of s3 times s1 is Hermitian which means simply that it's of type 1, 1. But it isn't Kähler. It can't be Kähler because the second Betty number of S3 times S1 is 0. So S3 times S1 can't have a Kähler metric, since the Kähler form on a compact Kähler manifold is always non-trivial in the second homology. So, OK, I describe one complex structure, but there really are a lot of them. And the reason is that I broke the symmetry in picking this complex structure. So the first factor of S3 times S1 is SU2. S3 is SU2, so it has SU2 symmetry on left and right. I'll call them SU2 left and SU2 right. The complex structure that I called I is invariant under one of them, say SU2 left. But SU2 right rotates I into two other complex structures, which we could call J and K. They satisfy a quaternion algebra. I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals minus 1 and ij is equal to k, equal to minus ji. So I said we rotate i into th the other two, but really you could more s s you know, uh, symmetrically say that there's a two-sphere worth of complex structures. i rotates into whole two-sphere of complex structures, which are linear combinations of ij and k. So this structure makes s3 times s1 what's called a hyper-complex manifold. The metric of S3 times S1, since it was Hermitian for I, and is invariant under SU2 left times SU2 right, is actually Hermitian for all of I, J, and K. So S3 times S1 is hyper-Hermitian. Yes. Uh, the answer question is, did I take the standard metric? And yes. Let's remember just where we got it. So I took this metric on R4 minus the origin. Then I divided by this operation, and we got the standard metric, except S1 had circumference T, capital T. So since it was a standard metric, it was invariant under rotations of either S3 or S1. And in particular, because it's invariant under rotations of S3, the complex structure I called I isn't unique. It's rotated into a whole IJK family. Now, um, we can get a second family by exchanging SU2 left with SU2 right. We could do that by just doing a reflection on S3. But a reflection on S3 isn't what, quite what we want to do because it's not a symmetry of the instanton equation that we eventually will be studying. What we want to do is a joint reflection of both factors of S3 times S1. That preserves the orientation, so it is a symmetry of the instanton equation. It, does ex it reverses the orientation of S3, so it exchanges SU2 left with SU2 right. And it maps IJK to another hypercomplex structure, I prime J prime K prime. One is invariant under SU2 left, the other is invariant under SU2 right. So, as I just said, essentially, since since this joint reflection row exchanges SU2 left and SU2 right, um, so IJK was invariant under SU2 left and rotated by SU2 right, and it's the other way around for I prime, J prime, K prime.
the metric of S3 times S1 was invariant under the joint reflection. So it's Hermitian also for this new family of complex structures. Now, since M equals S3 times S1, which is the same as SU2 times U1, it's a group manifold. So it has two natural flat connections, which I'll call, I'll call nabla and nabla prime. Nabla is defined by saying that left invariant one forms on M are covariantly constant. And nabla prime is defined by saying that right invariant one forms are covariantly constant. So i, j, and k are covariantly constant for nabla, and i prime, j prime, k prime are covariantly constant for nabla prime. Both connections are metric compatible, and they have completely anti-symmetric torsion, which is given up to sign by a closed three-form H, which in the sigma model is interpreted as the field strength H equals dB of the sigma model B field. So, so, when I, so if D is the Ramanian connection, The definition of, well, I just want to make clear the statement that the connection is metric compatible but with completely anti-symmetric torsion. So H is the field strength in the, if we were studying a sigma model whose target is S3 times S1. Actually, let me see what I said next on the slide. Okay. So H is the, the H which is relevant here is the Ramanian volume form of S3 as I've written here. So if D3 omega is the Ramanian volume form of S3, S3 had this round metric of radius one, so it has a Ramanian volume form once you pick its orientation. And the H, which is relevant here, is the Ramanian volume form of the three sphere. And then, well, Nabla is defined by the formula I've written, and Nabla prime is the same thing, but with H replaced by minus H. So, um, <coughs> here the torsion is completely anti-symmetric because H is a three form. But just the anti-symmetry in the first two indices would lead the definition of a connection being metric compatible. So here we have two connections that are both metric compatible with completely anti-symmetric and closed torsion. And it's also true that the two connections have equal and opposite torsion. One has torsion H, one has torsion minus H. That's clear because the two connections are exchanged by rho, the joint reflection. And the volume form of the three sphere is odd under that joint reflection. Now, in general, on a complex manifold M with metric G and complex structure I, you can define a Hermitian form that I've called omega I. So you take the metric times the complex structure, and you get a Hermitian form. But here, because there are so many complex structures, I'm calling it omega i rather than just omega. By definition, m is scalar if d omega is zero and not otherwise. In our case, the condition that the complex structure is covariantly constant for this connection that I've defined here, this one, and that the torsion of the connection is a three form, implies a formula for H in terms of omega I. H is minus I times D of omega I. And with a little computation on the three sphere, you can check that that's true in this example. Thus, if and only if M is not Kähler, which happens for S3 times S1, the B field curvature H is non-zero. <clears throat> so 
So this uh, funny formula I've written here is probably not very familiar, but it appears in the literature on n equals 2 supersymmetry. If you want the sigma model to have n equals 2 supersymmetry with a B field, to get n equals 2 supersymmetry, you need a complex structure and a Hermitian metric. If it's, not going, to, if it's going to have a non-flat B field, it will not be Kähler, and its failure to be Kähler is going to be related to the curvature of the B field by this formula. So this is a form, this expression here that I expect most of you might not be familiar with is the condition that you get for n equals 2 supersymmetry of a sigma model with a B field. However, if we want n equals 4 supersymmetry, what happens to us? Well, then we're worried about not one complex structure I, but three complex structures I, J, and K. If there had been no B field, we would have asked that the corresponding Kähler forms were all closed and we would get a hyper Kähler structure. With a B field, each of them is going to satisfy this equation. But there's only one B field of the sigma model, so they have to all satisfy the same equation with the same H. So the same formula must hold for J and K with the same H if we're going to get a sigma model with N equals 4 supersymmetry. So we need this to hold. And then the same sort of identity must hold for I prime, J prime, and K prime as they all have torsion minus H. So what I've explained up to this point is the geometry that leads to small n equals 4 supersymmetry with the B field. You need the two hypercomplex structures, I, J, K, and I prime, J prime, K prime. The metric is permission for all of them. None of the Hermitian forms are closed, and their failure to be closed is related to the curvature of the B field, but in such a way that this identity has to hold, and its counterpart for I prime, J prime, K prime also has to hold. So that's the, okay. that's the story for N equals 4 supersymmetry with the B field, as described by um, Gates, Hall, and Rochek in the 80s, and is eventually reinterpreted by Hitchin and Gualtieri in terms of generalized hyperkähler geometry. But what if we want large n equals 4 supersymmetry? Well, if we want large n equals 4 supersymmetry, we need to take into account the rotation symmetry of the circle. So the second factor, S1 of S3 times S1, has a, itself a rotation group generated by this vector field that I'll call V, which is d by d tau. And the properties of V that lead to large n equals 4 supersymmetry beyond what we already said for the small one are the following. First, V is covariantly constant for both novel and novel prime. And second, the vector fields I, V, J, V, and K, V generate SU2 right, while I prime V, J prime V, and K prime V generate SU2 left. By I, V, I, just, I as a complex structure is a map from the tangent space to itself. V is a vector field, so I V is another vector field, which is an SU2 generator, similarly for J V, K V, and so on in my statements. So the properties of S3 times S1 that I've just described lead to large N equals 4 supersymmetry for the sigma model with target S3 times S1, or for any target, really. What I've described are the properties that you need in order to get large N equals 4 supersymmetry in a sigma model. So to show that the sigma model with target the instant on moduli space M likewise has two copies of the large n equals 4 algebra, we have to show that it has the same properties. And that's what the rest of the talk will consist of, but I'll stop for a moment for questions on this, if there are any. Uh, if you could back a uh, few circles. Go back to the uh, uh, metric, uh, uh, the distance from the of the, the regular uh, metric, d s squared. The metric was this, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Indeed. Yeah. There was an omega d omega squared. I couldn't see from where it appeared. Well, d x squared. 
in polar coordinates is d r squared plus r squared d omega squared. d omega squared was what appears in this formula. And then what I did was um, I, I defined tau by r equals e to the tau. And then dx squared over x squared is this over r squared. So then I had dx, d omega squared plus d tau squared. Thank you, sir. Where r is e to the tau. I hope this wasn't in your way when I was writing on the blackboard. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, okay. So for the remaining time, I'm going to explain why the instanton moduli space has the same kind of geometry. Well, we get a little bit for free. For free, we have an orientation preserving symmetry group because isometries of S3 times S1 will obviously act on the instanton moduli space. So for free, we get the symmetry group S2 times S2 times U1 which is indeed part of the large n equals 4 algebra. But we only get for free the global part. We don't get for free holomorphic currents generating a current algebra. And it's also obvious that the joint reflection of the two factors will act. And that will mean that whatever we prove for um, i, j, and k will have a counterpart for i prime, j prime, and k prime. But the rest is up to us. We're on our own. So first, let's construct a Hermitian structure on the moduli space. On the space curly A of all connections on some smooth G bundle over S3 times S1, there's a natural Hermitian metric. Now, if we think of our four manifold M, which could be S3 times S1, but will be a little more general, as a complex manifold with complex structure I, then on the space of all connections, we have a corresponding complex structure curly I, by saying that if we make a Hodge decomposition of A relative to I, then curly I, I axis I on A01 and minus I on A10. That makes the space of all connections a Hermitian manifold. <clears throat> so that's the zeroth step. We want to turn the metric and complex structure <clears throat> on A into one on the instanton moduli space. Now, the first problem we face is that the metric is not invariant under a gauge transformation, where sigma is the generator of a gauge transformation. In other words, delta A is a variation of A, but we want to think of delta A as being equivalent to delta A minus something induced by a gauge transformation. But this formula for delta A squared is certainly not invariant under that. So, to get a so our metric does not descend automatically from A to a metric on the space of connections mod gauge transformations where G is the group of gauge transformations. To get a metric on A mod G, we need to pick a gauge condition on variations of the gauge connection. Any gauge condition will give a metric, but different gauge conditions lead to different metrics. Whatever metric we get on A mod G can be restricted to M, the subspace of A mod G corresponding to solutions of the instanton equation to get a metric on M. So the main step in getting a metric on M is to get a metric on A mod G. For example, an obvious gauge condition is Lorentz gauge. In the case of T4 or K3, it works well. But Lubke and Telemann show that we should use a different gauge condition in the case of a non kähler manifold M. The reason is we also want to define a complex structure on M, and we want the metric on M to be Hermitian for the complex structure. That means that what I called curly I should act on the tangent space to M at a generic point in M. Well, the tangent space is defined by the linearized instanton equation together with whatever gauge condition we pick. The linearized instanton equation is that, you see, the linearized curvature is the exterior derivative of the variation of the connection. So dA of delta A is a succinct way to write the variation of the f mu nu is d mu delta a nu minus d nu delta a mu. Uh, but an abbreviated version of that is d sub a of delta a. But then the instanton equation only sets the self-dual part of that to zero, which I've indicated by the superscript plus. 
If we make a Hodge decomposition relative to I, the linearized Instanton equation says that the 2, 0, and 0, 2 part vanish, and also the 1, 1 part vanishes. The 1, 1 part can be written as omega I wedged with dA of delta A. The equations in the first line are invariant under the action of the almost complex structure on the space of connections. But the one in the second line is not. So the only hope is to choose the gauge condition to be whatever the last equation transforms into under delta A going to I delta A. If you do that, then we'll have a set of equations that is invariant under the action of I. So the gauge condition has to be this one. With this gauge condition, we get an action of the almost complex structure on the tangent space to M at any point. It manifestly satisfies I squared equals minus one because the underlying uh, comp complex structure, which was I with a different font, squared to minus one on M. So it defines an almost complex structure on curly M. And the metric defined using the gauge condition is Hermitian because the metric is invariant under the action of curly I, which is equivalent to saying that it's of type 1, 1. We also want to know that curly I is integrable. That has a short proof by combining, comparing the gauge condition and the 1, 1 part of the equation to the action of complexified gauge transformations. Because, but I'm going to skip explaining that proof. So at this stage, we know that if M is a Hermitian manifold with metric G and complex structure I, then curly M is Hermitian. Curly M, if we define it with this gauge condition, is Hermitian with complex structure curly I. So we've shown that if M has the condition for 0, 2 supersymmetry, then so does curly M. Well, what if M has a hypercomplex structure I, J, K, with G being Hermitian for each? Well, then for each of i, j, and k, we define corresponding complex structures, curly i, curly j, and curly k, uh, on the space of connections. But it looks like we're going to be in trouble because I explained that there was a unique gauge condition we had to use in order for the metric to end up being Hermitian. And for, for each of i, j, and k, we're going to need to use different gauge conditions, leading generically to different metrics on m. However, something happens that's highly not obvious, as shown by Hitchin. Despite appearances, the gauge condition depends only on H, the, the B-field curvature of the sigma model with target M, which I, J, and K have in common, as I explained before, not on I. So rather miraculously, this gauge condition can be written this way. It's a highly non-obvious identity, I would say. But anyway, it's true. So given that it's true, you learn that the moduli space, this was kind of the main observation in the paper of Moraro and Verbitsky. Given that it's true, um, the lubke tellman construction can be carried out for each of i, j, and k using the same metric on the moduli space. And it's manifest that i, j, and k obey the quaternion relations since they were obeyed on the space of all connections, and in the construction, we just restrict from the tangent space to the space of all connections to the tangent space to M. So at this point, we know that M is hyper-complex, uh, hyper-hermitian. Uh, okay. We need one more thing to finish this proof that M has the structure of 0, 4 supersymmetry. We need to know that I, J, and K are compatible with the same torsion, which should be a closed three-form H hat on M. So Lubke and Telemann had actually computed the exterior derivative of the Hermitian form on moduli space. And Moraro and Verbitsky showed that their formula implies the identity we want. To say that curly i, curly j, and curly k are all compatible with the same three form. So denoting, denoting the common value of all three is h hat. This is the identity we need to ensure that i, j, and k all have the same torsion h hat. And H hat should therefore be the curvature of the B field on the instanton moduli space. So this would give us 0, 4 supersymmetry with the small n equals 4 algebra. What if, as in the case of S3 times S1, 
M has a second hypercomplex structure with torsion minus H. The computations of Lubkin Talman show that H hat is homogeneous and linear in H, so it's odd under H going to minus H. So if I prime, J prime, K prime have torsion minus H, then their cousins on the moduli space have torsion minus H hat. So this may seem to show that curly M is generalized hypercalar leading to small 4-4 supersymmetry, but there's a snag. There's a snag because for i, j, and k, we had to use this gauge condition, which miraculously was the same for all of i, j, and k. But for i prime, j prime, and k prime, we have to use a gauge condition that's actually different. And it seems, therefore, that we're going to get 0-4 supersymmetry. So generically, a different gauge condition will lead to a different metric on m. So if that's the state of affairs, one metric on m will lead to small 0-4 supersymmetry and the other will lead to small 4-0 supersymmetry, left and right-handed in the targets in the um, world, well, on the boundary of ADS3, actually. But another small miracle intervenes, as shown by her Hitchin, even though generically different gauge conditions lead to different metrics. In this particular case, the two different gauge conditions lead to the same metric on curly M. So at this point, that's the last ingredient we need to get small 4-4 supersymmetry. To extend to large 4-4 supersymmetry, the main thing we need to do is to show that if we lift the vector field V on M that generates the rotation of a circle to a killing vector field V hat on M, we need to know that V hat is covariantly constant for the two flat connections associated to the two hypercomplex structures. Now, the flat connections are defined this way. I'll just put hats on everything to tell us that we're on the moduli space rather than on the original manifold. And well, we basically have the lubke telemann formula for H hat. Well, originally it was a formula for D omega, but reinterpreted as a formula for H hat. And a computation um, using essentially their lubke telemann formulas, you can prove that this is true, although I won't try to explain the details of that computation today. So that's as much as I'll tell you about why the instanton moduli space has the same geometry as the underlying four manifold. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes, one there. Uh, <clears throat> two questions. Uh, first, uh, what's the geometric interpretation of this modified gauge condition? The Lorentz condition is the, uh, the usual metric definition. If I want to define a distance between two, two gauge orbits, I just find two closest points. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Let me explain to everybody what you've just said. We have two gauge orbits, and you want to know how far apart they are. And one way to decide how far apart are two orbits is take the closest point, closest possible distance between two points on the two orbits. And that's what the Landau gauge condition does. So the Landau gauge condition is intuitively natural. And also it gives the best answer for hypercalar manifolds and in lots of other applications of instantons. The lubke telemann gauge condition uh, isn't so intuitively natural. I can't justify it except that it's the gauge condition that makes everything work in this problem. <laughs> I had, sorry, I had a second question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so in your original notation, you had, it seemed like you had a symmetry, Q5 going to Q5, exchanging yes. Q5 and Q5 prime. So there is a system of intersecting D5 brains, uh, yes. and there is a uh, modular space of crossed instantons, which yes. uh, seem to be related to it. Yes. So, Nikita is asking the following question. We had the system that was parameterized by integers q1, q5, and q5 prime. And the underlying problem in ADS3 times S3 times S3 times a circle has an obvious symmetry between q5 and q5 prime, which has been completely lost in this presentation. I can only tell you one special case. In my lecture, q1 is positive. But in the underlying problem, it makes sense for q1 to be 0. And Modestana. Unfortunately, I've forgotten which Modesena paper it is. Modesena, and I apologize to his co-author for forgetting right now, showed that if Q1 is zero, there is a symmetry between Q5 and Q... Okay. Then, okay. In my lecture, it was R2 times a circle, but it could have been any three manifold times S3. 
They considered this, this side output with Q1 equals zero and showed that the exchange of Q5 and, so Q5 became the rank of the gauge group. Q5 prime was the level of return Simons coupling. And then this showed that the symmetry between the two was level rank duality of the turn Simons theory at low energies. Okay, I should explain the following. All this only holds in the low energy limit. So in the brain derivation, we didn't have the large n equals four algebra except when we take the near horizon limit. And in the sigma model, it's like the WZW model. Um, there's a special metric which is super conformally invariant and all that, but a generic one isn't. So, when I was motivating the brain construction, we started with a large S3 compared to the flux in order to justify the discussion. So we were actually far away from the conformally invariant metric. We have to flow in the infrared. I've answered the question as much as I can, so let's move on to other questions. So if you leave this instant from S3 tensors 1 back to C2, uh, will there be sort of dilatation in periodic yes. instantons? Yes. Uh, yes, dilatation in periodic instantons. Uh, yes. Okay. And could one sort of make a variant of the ADHM construction which would build them? Something with infinitely well, many? <laughs> that's an excellent question. I don't, the question was, is there a version of the ADHM construction for instantons on S3 times S1? That would be nice. Uh, I don't know a version of the ADHM construction with the B field, but I can't say there isn't one. It would be great if there is. Maybe there is. The, start, the actual ADHM starting point involved twister space. There's certainly a twister space here because it's hyper complex. I have no idea. I, I, good question. Greg? So the second Hitchin miracle was pretty shocking. So. The two gauge conditions with H and minus H yes. lead to the same metric. Yes. Is there some intuitive way to see why that's true? <laughs> no, but it's a rather was short a shock. calculation. I agree with you that it's shocking, and it, I'm glad you say so because uh, I consider it shocking, but when I prepared the lecture, I had trouble seeing in the available time how I'd be able to make people shocked, but at least one person was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but although it's shocking, it's a surprisingly short calculation if you look at Hitchin's proof. Uh, the other one that the gauge condition that the that the gauge condition well, that this gauge condition is actually independent of I is also pretty strange. If you look at Hitchin's proof, it's again short, but to a physicist, rather bizarre looking. Yes. A very nice talk. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the instantons on S3 times S1, but yeah. are, is there a relation with symmetric products, the moduli space? No, the, the moduli space is not a symmetric product. Only for very special ones it is. Oh, uh, sorry. Like uh, rank one and... One of the papers I mentioned by Eberhard et al. Um, gives evidence that for Q5 equals one, right. the, uh, the, target, the dual is a sigma model of a symmetric product, and it's that's the case. The gauge group is U1, and it's credible that the moduli right. space should be regarded as. So in that case, probably there's a simple proof also for showing that as large n equals four algebra just by usual over overvolt construction. Yes. Well, it's manifest. That was part of the motivation for right. the symmetric product, since S3 times S1 has the large n equals four algebra. So does the symmetric product. Right. So if you go to the Coulomb branch, I mean, isn't there a way to put them together? In other words. Uh, just piecing together un as u1 to the n and putting each one u1 would be as, uh, n equals to four large algebra. So bringing them together, would there, would there not be a way to do it that way, to show it's large n equals to four? Maybe. Uh, uh, There's, is there any, any other understanding of the uh, instant modular space similar to symmetric product for general case? Uh, well, there's very little literature on it that I know about. And no. The only simplification I know about, Brahm and Herderby's showed that it's elliptically fibered. Because, uh, not elliptically fibered, sorry. S3 times S1 itself is elliptically fibered. That's a classical fact. And using that, you can show that the instanton moduli space, it's algebraically completely integral. It's fibered by uh, complex tori. That's the only... Uh, any simplified property, well, first of all, there's very little literature on it, but secondly, any simplifying property that's known follows from that.
just want to comment on that exchange with Kumran. Uh, so one of the main points of the paper I wrote with Gukov, Martinik, and, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> Strominger, <laughs> uh, uh, it is, it was that um, we argued that it, 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 the dual cannot be a symmetric product. So we, we, we constructed indices and we looked at uh, singleton theories and we argued that it was probably not a symmetric product. So I would be <laughs> uh, doubly shocked. I've already been shocked a few times, but I would be doubly shocked if, um, if the... Uh, the modulus space of uh, UQ was was a symmetric product. Well, in any case, it's not, so you don't have to worry about that one. <laughs> can can you? Um, I think you said it's, it's at some moment in this discussion, this kind of this large n equals four forced you to be uh, not Kähler. Yeah. Is, is, that, is that true in well, general? It, well, it's true in general for a compact manifold. Because to get large n equals 4, you need a hyper-complex manifold with an SU2 symmetry that rotates the three complex structures. But a, hype, a compact hyper manifold can't have such a symmetry. It, more generally, a compact Einstein manifold can't. And a hyper manifolds manifold through Einstein. Uh, hi. So presumably the uh, S dual here, uh, S dual of this uh, from the supergravity point of view will work as uh, in the same way if you have N S five lines. Yes. So it, is it in the same moduli space as the, the, as the sigma model? What? Is it is it somewhere in the same moduli space of this uh, sigma model? Uh, is what somewhere? Uh, uh, the, the S dual version of this. Thing. Well. Well, Greg and others in their paper claim that there aren't really any non-trivial dualities of this moduli space, um, apart from obvious ones. You can realize the moduli space with D5 brains or NS5 brains in the string theory, but um, can't interpolate it in the moduli space between them, I don't think. There aren't different weekly, the moduli space is actually very, actually, sorry, I didn't explain it in the talk, but a minor bit of, a small bit of evidence for the duality between ADS3 times S3 times S3 times S1 and this instant on moduli space is that they both have precisely two moduli. One is the radius of the circle, and the other is the theta angle. There only are those two moduli. And uh, there are some obvious reflections. That there's a parity symmetry, I guess, but uh, I think that's the only... Uh, I hope I'm not forgetting something. I think that's the only duality symmetry. So is there any cage holonomy along the circle? Is there any what? Cage holonomy along the circle. Cage anomaly? Holonomy. Wilson loop along the circle. Uh, well, you could consider Wilson operators around the circle. Uh, you probably can consider supersymmetric Wilson operators around the circle. I don't, I don't have any useful comments at the moment, though. I see your question by Lance. Uh, I just want to comment on Greg's comment, if that's okay. Um, because uh, there has been a lot of confusion in the literature about the BPS spectrum on this background. And part of the argument uh, that Greg and others gave in their paper uh, that there cannot possibly be a symmetric product dual to this background was by comparing the BPS spectrum that was computed on the bulk side in supergravity and in the symmetric product. In the symmetric product, the BPS spectrum that you get doesn't seem to match with the supergravity, but that was based on an earlier computation where the BPS spectrum was based on a guess. And that was later repeated, that computation, and it was actually shown that the BPS spectrum in supergravity is different than what was originally thought. Um, so I think that at least if you check, if you compute the BPS spectrum in the symmetric product of S3 times S1, it does match with the supergravity BPS spectrum. And uh, yeah, we can also discuss indices if you want. 
Well, since the question has more or less come up, I'm going to tell you how to prove that the moduli space isn't a symmetric product for no added cost. <laughs> so here's a three sphere, and here's a vector field in the three sphere. You look at its fixed points on the moduli space and on the symmetric product. On the moduli space, Graham and Hurtubis describe the fixed points out of this vector field, and it has many components as they analyzed. You can work out the fixed points out on the symmetric product, and you'll quickly see that it's connected. So the two spaces are different for what it's worth. Uh, OK, if there are no more. <laughs> OK, the very last question. Sorry. <laughs> Um, there are um, a, a very rich um, classes of uh, BPS operators in the uh, string theory size in ADS3, S, uh, S3, S3, S1, yes. uh, like uh, Wilson lines, BPS. Yes. You expect uh, there are some uh, operators uh, in correspondence with uh, this class of operators in a string theory size or, or not? So, uh, I hope so. That's an excellent question. So the question was the following. In ADS three times S three times S three times S one, you could, with various brains and so on, and the boundary perhaps, define all kinds of supersymmetric probes. Uh, the question, I think, is what do they mean in terms of the instant on moduli space? I'm sure some are easier to understand than others, because one of the S threes is hidden in this description and the other is manifest. But I think it's a good question. OK, I think we can stop here and thank Ed again.